Amen. Let's go to Acts chapter 1. Can you give me some juice on this, see if it, uh, or some power to see if it works now? Still okay? Okay, okay, okay. We're better? Okay, good. I'll, uh, I'll hear it if it starts to muffle on me. It's, I like to be free. You know, because somebody told me years ago that if I didn't have any hands, I wouldn't be able to talk. So, <laughs> I need my hands to talk. <laughs> Acts chapter 1, we're going to finish, well, we're going to uh, continue the message from last week, stay in the room, stay in the room. And we're going to read the portion of scripture we read last week, Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 12. When they, these were the disciples and many of the followers that Jesus had with them, returned to Jerusalem from the mountain of called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, and the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, and together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So they went in to the room, they went to the city where they needed to wait for the Father's promise that Jesus told them to wait for. We already talked about this last week. I'm going to review just a little bit to catch us up on what we're going to cover today. But today, I think I'm going to have me a little bit of a rowdy group. They started rowdy. And I'm not about to let, where's Bob? I'm going to have to have Bob get up here (laughs) and get him rowdy again. They see Bob and they start talking. I don't understand that. But anyways, (laughs) so we want to talk about the power of the room. There is no power in a room, obviously. It's a play, kind of a play on words, sort of. But it is the power of being able to be in a room and wait and do what God has required in order to receive all that God has for us. Amen? Amen. You know, in a world where now we are still keeping our, trying to keep our distance, some of us having a real difficult time with that. (laughs) Glory to God. Yet for several weeks... We've been in some rooms. Some have made the best of it. Others have gotten depressed out of it, from it, or as a result of it. Because it is not easy to be tucked away in a room or in a house or in a small apartment like some of us are. And it is tough. But don't worry, I did not get depressed. I actually, (laughs) I hardly was at home, actually. (laughs) But it is in those places when we are locked in, where we are, you know, just tucked away, when we are taking time and not having too many distractions from the outside, that Jesus has a way of speaking and making himself more real than ever. Because he requires our undivided attention. He's always speaking. And it's amazing to me, I don't know if you've ever had this problem, that you're talking to somebody, but all of a sudden the phone rings, or, or they get a, a buzz or something like that on their phone, and they right away have to look at the phone while you're talking. And you're talking. And now the thumb starts to go. You can almost walk away, and they don't even realize you just walked away, because you, you lost them, Right? You know, we do, that. we do the same thing with God. We all have. I have. So we have to be disciplined in just saying, okay, I'm going to put my phone away. I'm going to put the TV away. I'm going to put this thought away. I'm going to take care of my real estate so that he covers the entire place. Right? Don't let anybody sit in the furniture of your room. Come on, somebody. Don't let those that are not supposed to be sitting in that room, except you and Jesus, unless there are two or three gathered in his name, and then the thing changes. So we were talking about last week, the room. And it's important to stay in the room when there is a conversation going on. We're talking about the power of the room, because if we want to resolve issues, 
If we want to have true justice in our country, if we want to deal with true racial reconciliation as the problems that are arising today, again, if we want to have the right leadership in our nation, whether it's in the White House or the Supreme Court or at the House, wherever, representatives, both local and national, if you want to even have good spiritual leadership, somebody's got to spend some time in the room. Somebody's got to have a real concrete conversation and somebody's going to have to pray for real and somebody's going to have to invite Jesus to enter the room and begin to change some things around. See, there is a reason. There are three reasons. I gave you three reasons, I think, last week. If not, uh, then these are new. I don't remember if I gave you these or not. Three reasons you need to stay in the room before, during, and after making a decision. Number one... It's important to get God's heart and vision in a matter. Because believe it or not, God cares about the smallest things in your life. Everything is important to God, everything. And if you want to go in the right direction, you want to make the right decisions. If you want to have the right thoughts in the process, you've got to get the heart of God in the matter. So that you know exactly how to, how to judge the situation and realize that it's either a God idea or if it's a, just a good idea. If it's God's plan or just your plan. If it's going to be beneficial to all or just to you. Right? Secondly, we get God's wisdom on how to go about the matter or the decision. So you get his heart and vision in a matter, then you get his wisdom, and thirdly, you get God's timing and strategies and plans of action, because in God, there is a time for everything. It's amazing to me how I believe that we can do something today, but God doesn't think so. <laughs> and so it takes, it has taken me years, because some of us are very quick learners, what others Years to try to comply to God's timetable. Because though I don't like using microwave ovens for my, to warm up my food, because they are bad for your food, they destroy all the nutrition in it. Just a little revelation, because that's very spiritual. <laughs> Yet I like microwavable time where I pray and in three seconds I get my answer. Are you with me? If you're the same way, shout amen. amen. Yeah, I know that. Glory to God. So we are. It's our culture, right? We want it now. Worst thing is you pull through the drive through and then they tell you, can you just pull over to the side here until we get the coffee done? It's a cup of coffee, man. Don't make me wait. There's a reason why I came through the drive through I didn't want to wait. God, if I wanted to wait, I wouldn't be praying about it right now. Come on, somebody. But it takes time. It takes time. This is so old school. It's, uh, it's old school. <laughs> I mean, you know, I know that maybe some of somebody, maybe even watching by television or YouTube or Facebook or whatever, might be thinking, dude, you need to be a little hip with your message and quit being so old school. Bring it on to the 21st century. Well, you know, it's amazing, but God, though he's just so relevant in the 21st century, he still has first century ways. He's never in a hurry. But he's always on time. So I want to give you a challenge this morning. Because while I want the answers from God. And he doesn't give me an answer. I quickly go to Google God to find my answers. Right? It's typical. We, we do it. It's just become a habit. It's part of our second nature now. To do it. And, and so I want to give you a challenge that we received. We were given this challenge. And I gave this challenge on Friday night to those that were with us on the bon, uh, around the, the, fire, uh, the bonfire outside. And so there was this, uh, this challenge was given to all the ministers of the Assemblies of God in Ohio. And I'm going to give it to you right now here at harvest time. And so if you're an obedient child of God... No, <laughs> Ali is just, oh, Lord, here we go. Listen, you sit in the front row. I'm going to pick on you. 
And I'm going to anoint you real good. You understand? <laughs> and of course, this row is a little closer. My wife would not be too happy, so I just, I don't care whether you're happy or not. I'm just going to anoint you. <laughs> Gauge your time. Here's your challenge. Gauge your time that you spend on social media, on all of it. You know, studies have proven, they've done studies for several, the last few years, and they're, constant, they're very consistent, very consistent. This is what they discovered. The average person spends 144 minutes daily on social media. You know how much that is? That's 2.24 hours a day on social media. So here's the challenge. If you're like me, where you only spend four minutes, you know, that was not supposed to be funny. <laughs> Nobody needed to laugh about that. I know, I just lied a little bit. But it was just a little bit. So if you spend 30 minutes on social media, add a minute to that, 30 minutes. Make it 31 minutes, and then spend 31 minutes in prayer. Challenge yourself with the amount of time you spend on social media, add a minute to it and spend that much time in prayer, and you will see what God will do. Wonder what would happen to harvest time. I wonder what would happen to our individual lives if we reprioritize things and make prayer more important than social media. If social media is not your thing, then don't worry, we got the TV for you. <laughs> the same way, right? See, I don't care what you're going through in life. What kind of simple decisions you need to make, like getting married, like having a baby, simple stuff. <laughs> Everybody does it. <laughs> Choosing a career, going to college, what vacation to go to, what kind of car to buy, what kind of house to purchase, whatever the case may be. If you don't make it a priority in prayer, it will not come out the way it's supposed to be. You will, you're only shooting from the hip and you will get second best at best. And so, listen, God has done amazing things. He's done amazing things and because most of us were forced to stay in a room somewhere, God has been doing some deep surgery in the hearts and beginning to reveal some things that we'll get to some of it here in a minute. But the thing is that when you are in a room, somebody say room. God will reveal things to us like he's never revealed in any other time. Though this quarantine time has been frustrating, yet it hasn't been that bad at all. Because in many ways, it's been very good. I think that this was probably one of the best things the church could have gone through. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not going to belittle the fact that some people didn't have the income. Those things, those, those things are tough. I'm not saying that, you know, uh, that it doesn't matter even though church, some churches got closed because, the, you know, they closed up because there was no income, no offerings, no nothing, and they couldn't keep up with the bills, so they closed the doors, and now there's no more of that church in town. I'm not, those things are serious, so don't get me wrong. Well, at the same time, though, I am amazed at how much God us when we are in secret and when we are struggling behind closed doors and we're trying to pray through and we're trying to seek God and we're trying to ask for his mind and heart in the matter and still by the time you're done you're still more confused than you were when you are asked before you started praying because God is doing something and he will not do it right away he'll take time because he wants you to do it just right for your own good because the Bible tells me that all things work together for our own good. For those that are called of God and are called according to his purpose. Those that love God. Those that have given their lives to God. Everything is working for our own good. You may not think so, but trust me, it is. Amazing. We talked about last week about the upper room in the Old Testament. We won't go into that where it's found. Of course, the scripture is 1 Chronicles 28, 11 through 12, and how David gave uh, his son Solomon all the blueprints of the temple, including where the upper rooms were going to be at. We talked about the upper room in the New Testament. 
and what they consisted of and what they were for, right? They were designed for fellowship. They were designed to have an encounter with God and connect, have a connection with God between, between God and humanity. They were, they were a place where people reunited, where they were refreshed. They were rejuvenated. It was a great place, the upper room. It was a place of spiritual impact and gifts, Acts chapter 2. And it is also a place of where Christ-like people get together, like Acts number 1 and like harvest time. Come on. But then there's the upper room with Jesus. And this is where things begin to change before it got better in the book of Acts. We'll eventually get to the book of Acts. But right now we got to deal with Jesus. Because when Jesus enters the upper room where his disciples are, things begin to shake a little bit. It was in that upper room when Jesus asked his disciple to go before he goes to the cross. He wanted to have one more meal with him because he needed to observe the Passover. And so they're going to have the meal and they're going to do all that. But there Jesus took care of some other businesses because when Jesus enters a room, it may be just a tra typical traditional thing to just go to church. But when Jesus enters the room, he begins to shift things. He begins to sift others and he begins to change hearts and he begins to transform somebody he begins to change the mindset he begins to set things in order including your own spiritual furniture in your own house come on somebody i wish somebody would help me preach in this house today i am burning up on the end. i am hot this morning if you touch me your finger gets red no never mind don't want to hurt you i'm serious this thing is burn it's been burning for two weeks and you're about to have it. Say, give it to me, pastor. Ah, uh, three of you, good. Uh, now, let's see. Give it to me, pastor. Thank you. I thank you for the permission. Here we go. So Jesus gets to the room, and then the first thing that he points out is the fact, the scriptures bring this out, one of the first things that happened is that the disciples started arguing amongst themselves as to who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Wow, Seriously? Your master's about to go to the cross. You don't have a whole lot of time. You know things are different because when things are shifting in the atmosphere, you feel a little funny. Things begin to change. Things begin to shift a little bit. And here they are wondering, am I going to be, I'm going to be better than you when I come to the kingdom. No, I'm going to be the one in charge of the finances. Oh, no, I'm going to be in charge of the law. I'm going to have me the books. I'm going to be in charge of all this, all this, all this army out there. I'm going to be... It's like, just shut your mouth. And Jesus said, let me tell you who the best one is. The greatest one in the kingdom is going to be. And he pulls out a towel and a little bit of water and begins to wash her feet. And say, you want to be great? Wash feet. You want to be great? Help somebody. You want to be great? Serve somebody. You want to know why God shows up in this house? Because in this house, we have people sitting right next to you that are willing to serve and have servants' hearts. That's the reason why. It ain't about washing feet literally, like because in our culture, that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't apply to our culture. That's true. But in that culture, it applied a whole lot. Other things are applicable in our culture. So Jesus began to demonstrate what true servanthood was all about. So the argument that the disciples had, Jesus fixed it real quick by simply bowing down and saying, this is how you do it, kids. This is how you do it. Secondly, during the Last Supper, while Jesus is eating the Last Supper with his disciples, he had an amazing spread. Think, I mean, listen, put yourself in his shoes. You are one of the 12. Even if you're a female, just kind of hang with me. I know there were 12 guys, but hey, you're one of the 12. You're sitting around the table, and you're having a meal with Jesus. You're having a meal with the creator of the universe, the one that you have served for three and a half years, the one that you did miracles with, you casted out demons, you set people free, you raised the dead, you did all kinds of stuff. You see, you've been doing this for three and a half years with Jesus. You've been following him. You've been serving with him. You've seen at first hand, I mean, through your own hand, stuff is happening. And you're now sitting at this table. And you don't know when the next meal is going to be. You don't know what tomorrow is going to come. 
And you're having a tremendous time. And Jesus performs. And I don't have time to explain to you the setter and what it takes place in this Passover meal. But let me just give it to you this way. As they're partaking, as they're eating together, here's the second thing Jesus does. Jesus identifies his traitor. He identifies his traitors. Judas, who would betray him to the authorities and bring, him, bring about his arrest. It is indicative of the disciples, weak, their weak faith, that each of them consider the possibility that maybe themselves, they were the ones that were going to betray him. They started talking amongst themselves, saying, it can't possibly, is it me? Is it me? I remember years ago, I don't know, 32 years ago, 33 years ago, we did a play at our church in Minneapolis. In Minneapolis. We had a powerful church. And it was about the Last Supper. And I was Thaddeus. Remember that? I was out of all people. But they chose the coolest disciple. But anyways... So one of the main things we did, we were, we were working on this particular scene. And we all went, is it I? Is it I? And we're trying to, and some of us were moved at the thought of, could I have betrayed him? So put yourself in those shoes. Jesus very quickly, he confirmed that Judas was the one. Jesus even gave him a chance to repent at the Last Supper. When Jesus asked him, he said, I'm going to dip this bread and I'm going to give it to you and I want you to do the same and receive it. He is the one that is going to betray him, betray me. So Jesus takes the bread, dips it in the wine and begins to give it to Judas and Judas at this point understood what was happening because this was a cultural act. This is simply an act, a Hebraic act, that for them what this meant was we have severed relationship and your heart has been so distant from me that I want to reconcile that relationship and I want to give you the opportunity to eat with me. Jesus said, in the book of Revelation, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears me knock and opens the door, I will come into him and I will eat with him and he with me. The word there is used, sob. It's the same word in Hebrew that they were using here. It's a reconciliation. It is an act of reconciliation. But that Jesus was doing as he revealed one thing Jesus will do every time when he brings about a judgment is for the sake of reconciliation. Jesus never judges anyone to send them to hell. He judges the sin in order for their hearts to be reconciled to God. Jesus gave him a chance. But Judas, his heart and heart kept him so away from him. Money and status and the devil's agenda. And he didn't even have the guts to say no and, and use the power that Jesus was offering him to simply take of the bread that had been dipped in the wine. It's a simple act. But you see, in the room, in the place where Jesus was sitting with his disciples, Jesus reveals his traitor. This is not a time to become judgmental. This is a time to reveal the heart of God in a matter. The truth shared in love will always prevail and always has a way of pulling the traitor from the inside of you. I'm getting personal now. You thought I was just going to talk about Judas, didn't you? See, Jesus is in the business of reconciliation reconciling mankind to himself you see you can't tell me that you love Jesus while you hate your brother John says that you can't tell me that you love Jesus while you despise somebody because they're of a different color come on somebody 
You can't tell me that you love Jesus and you actually support in one people to abort their children. You cannot tell me that. That is not the heart of God. That is not the heart of the church. Doesn't matter the color. It doesn't matter the circumstances. No, sir. Jesus calls that a sin. And Jesus says that's the traitor that is trading the heart of God, the love of God, for simply 30 silvers, 30, 30 uh, coins, sil uh, silver coins. And somebody's got to take the time to take some bread and dip it in the wine, if you will. Dip it in the grape juice. Dip it in milk. Dip it in water. Dip it in gasoline if that's all you have. I don't care what you're going to dip it in. But somehow, somebody's going to have to sit in a room with somebody else, have a serious conversation, and take some bread and dip it and say, can we reconcile? Can we come together? Can we share hearts to heart? Can we embrace one another? Can we work together? Because at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is the love of God. At the end of the day, the only thing that matters is the love of God in the church of Jesus Christ, first and foremost, and the love of God being displayed all throughout the earth. Amen. Somebody, somebody needs to dip the, dip the bread of reconciliation. God wants to restore lives. He wants to provide information. He wants to impart wisdom. He wants to impart understanding. He wants to impart the love of God, the fear of God. God wants to impart himself, and he is ready, always ready with a piece of bread and a little bit of wine, if you will. But all that takes place in no other place except in a room. In a room. Where intimacy is developed, where hearts are revealed, where, where, where potential is, is actually perfected. Judas was one of the 12, doing everything that the other 11 did. But he let the devil get a piece of his mind. And eventually his mind got a piece of his heart. And eventually he ends up trading his best friend. He ends up trading his creator. He ends up trading the one that wound up going to the cross. He ends up trading the one that was giving him life even at the time for simply $3,000 in today's currency. Sin will make you stupid. Did you hear that? Sin makes me stupid. Somebody once said, some theologian after all things. Well, you know, Judas was designed for that. He was called the son of perdition and the poor guy didn't have a chance. That's one of the biggest lies I've ever heard. You think Jesus created a man to make him fail and send him to hell? Are you serious? You think Jesus gave him the, 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 the bread of reconciliation as a joke? And then they call that the sovereignty of God. They really don't know what the sovereignty of God is. Listen, God doesn't set anybody up for failure. Well, you know, I'm glad my wife agreed with that. Glory to God. God doesn't set anybody up for failure. Amen. Nobody. Nobody. Thing is, he dabbled in Satan's scheme and trickery. In his life for lies for, for uh, way too long. I'm here to tell you this morning that when you spend time with Jesus, he will definitely at some point in time reveal a Judas characteristic in you. He's done it for me many, with me many times. And it isn't a fun time. But listen, that is, are you ready for this? That is part of revival. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it's the part that no, none of us like. But it is part of it. I mean, you know, by the way, I got to share this with you. Jesus, uh, Judas's name means Jehuda in, the, in, the, in Hebrew. And his name means, are you ready? The one that some people think that God created him to just betray him because the poor guy had no chance. His name meant celebrate it. Celebrate it. Every time you call Judas, you're calling, hey, celebrate it. Come over here. Celebrate it. Can you just come and sup with me? Celebrate it. God, Jesus was trying to celebrate something with this man. 
And it had to be the one that was only calling the entire team celebrated to actually bring destruction to his life. The potential that he had, the savior of the world, the one who was meant, whose name meant salvation, reached after, celebrated, and celebrated, eventually traded him. And God has designed your life to be celebrated. He's designed every step to be celebrated. But the lies of the enemy, circumstances of life, and the shortcomings of our own character have the tendency to destroy the character of the one whom God has called celebrated. So when you think that your life doesn't have a chance because X, Y, C is not working for you, the opposite is actually true. So when you've prayed and pray, and all that time that you spend, all them five minutes, don't get the answer after the six minute. Don't give up because God is still in the process of celebrating you, celebrating what he's doing on the inside of you, bringing change, bringing a transformation, and the ministry of reconciliation will be part of the agenda of the day. When you feel abandoned, when you feel unloved, or counting your failures more than your successes, I'm here to tell you this morning that you should not fear because Jesus is in the room. Jesus is right there with you. Jesus got a cup with him. Jesus got a piece of bread with him. And Jesus is about to dip it, if you will. And Jesus is about to hand you the ministry of reconciliation. And you are about to do something you ain't never done before. Your eyes are going to be open. Your mind is going to be exploding. Your heart is going to be transformed because you simply took a bite of the bread of reconciliation. Sometimes all we need is to lock ourselves in a room. Sometimes we need to get rid of all distractions. Sometimes we need to get rid of the things that are less than. They may still be good, but they're not as good as hanging out with Jesus in the room. I got to close. <laughs> I'm working hard up here, y'all. <laughs> I'm out of breath. <laughs> Somebody said, that's because you're out of shape, son. <laughs> hey, relax, all right? <laughs> relax. <laughs> 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 Listen, my heart is just overflowing and overwhelmed with the fact that God has so much for his church, so much for his kids. And so often, even my own time, my own schedule becomes my greatest straight traitor. My own ideas, my own plans. Become my greatest traitor. Can I tell you a secret? Just between me and you. <laughs> Just between me and you. Here's a secret. Your plans, your agenda, your good desires are not anywhere as good as what God has for you. Amen. Nowhere near. Nowhere near. You say, Pastor, why, why do you say that? You just say you're out of shape. That's not good. I didn't say I was out of shape. I said somebody said <laughs> I was out of shape. <laughs> this 55-year-old man can run a mile just fine. Can climb 153 steps. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Yeah, twice. <laughs> Don't mess with me. I climb ladders way up there. And then I'll say like Arnold, from I'll be buck to oh my buck. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but hey, we won't go there. Truth is, truth is, 
God has so much in store for us. And it hurts him. I can only imagine what Jesus must have felt, what he must have thought, and what the disciples as their jaws would just drop when they realized that Judas was not only the traitor, he also rejected the offer of reconciliation. Only for later to give him a, the kiss. Jesus said, with a kiss you betray me, Judas. With a kiss you betray me, celebrate it. I wanted to celebrate your life. You should have let me. He didn't need a traitor to go to the cross. There was plenty of people against him. All he had to do was turn himself in. Essentially, that's what he did anyways. We know the story. But can I tell you that whatever it is that stands in the way between you and God is your traitor. It's your traitor. And it's causing you to put your thing before his thing. It's causing you to think of yourself more than others. It's causing you to think of yourself. It even causes you to think of your own pain more than somebody else's pain. Are you with me? Are we connect? Am I connecting? So this is just simply a heads up. Because when Jesus is in the house, he reveals the traitor that's in the house. For the purpose of reconciliation. For the purpose of restoration. For the purpose of making things right. So don't let anything, anything betray, destroy, and separate you from your own creator. Fight it back. Don't let some racial issue divide you. Don't let some looter some destroyer cause you to anger and even develop hatred. Guard your heart. We are living in sensitive, tender times. The devil has gone crazy because he knows he's losing time. That's all that's happening, y'all. That's all that's happening. He's losing time. He's losing ground. And he thought he would shut the church up. But then the church... Went rogue online. <laughs> <That ch laughs> I'm serious. He thought he couldn't get anybody saved for a few weeks. People are getting saved by the droves online. <laughs> we have one church right here in town. Well, not in this town. But in Cuyahoga County. Journey Church, as a matter of fact. One day, about three or four weeks ago, they got 13 people saved online. The next Sunday, they got 27 people saved. All online. All online. <laughs> Devil ain't going to be able to shut the church up. They may try, but they can't succeed. They may try it a little bit, but they can't make it happen. Because this whole thing is being controlled by the great I am. This whole thing is being taken care of by the good Lord Almighty, the one that is in charge even of those who think they got the authority. God is in charge. Listen, God is in charge. Amen. So stay in the room. Don't leave the room until you take care of your traitor. Next week, we'll look at how Jesus waited to do the final communion process, as we call it. Until he first got rid of his traitor. Then he went into the covenant. We'll explain that one next week. Let's stand together.
If you only knew how much it hurts the heart of God. When good things, good things, I'm not talking evil stuff, good things get in the way and become a traitor. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that Judas was evil, that he was the bad guy, that he was stealing money from the funds since he was the treasurer. Jesus trusted this man with the ministry finances. He was, he was part of the team. He was a good guy. And he had a chance. Just close your eyes for a second. Just going to ask you a question and I just want you to think through it. I'm going to use an analogy in this question, so listen well. What in your life has been offering you a measly $3,000 for your relationship with Jesus? What in your life that's good is getting in the way of what's best? One thing I've learned is that as I ask God for more, saying, Jesus, I want more of you, eventually he leads me to a season of forgiving someone that had made me angry, of letting go of even some of my dreams because they were not his dreams and he has a better dream for you. He's even asked me the question, if you want this, I'll give it to you. But I have a different idea. Which one do you want? Either way, you'll be blessed. But if you go with my idea, you'll be extremely blessed. What's getting in the way? Can you make a decision today to say, Jesus, can I have a piece of that bread? Jesus, I want to just repent of what I've let get into my heart that stands in the way of you and me. I just want a piece of that bread. I want my heart to be right with you, Lord. I can't exchange something for your love. No way. Don't dare walk out of this place without taking care of that matter. Because after all, you may get the $3,000 and eventually throw it back to those that gave it to you. In the end, that won't matter. But if you allow Jesus to celebrate your life and celebrate what he has with you, for you, What he has for humanity, what he has for our community, what he has for our country, what he has for the world. Celebrate with Jesus and anticipate a deeper, deeper walk with him. It'll just blow you away. Father, we thank you, God, for your presence today. So many things, God, that were not part of my agenda. So many things, God, that you wanted to reveal, to share, you wanted to bring out, you wanted to remind us, including me.
Thank you. Lord, we do rejoice for celebrating this morning. But we also rejoice for revealing, Lord, truth. Because it simply says that you are in the room. Thank you, Lord, for accepting our invitation to be part of this gathering. For you are our guest of honor. And we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. I pray, God, may every wound of the past be fully healed. May everything that has a name bow to your name. May every soul that's represented in this place that do not know you today be a day of salvation for them, a day of reconciliation for them. And Father, may today be a day when we decide to return, to return what the enemy has tried to give us to divide our relationship with you, our intimacy, the secret place. I will not, Lord, exchange the room with you for another empty room. Thank you, God, for your grace, for your kindness. And thank you, Father, for your power of reconciliation. In Jesus' name, I bless this congregation today. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you so so much. God bless you so much. 